So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Catherine Wilhelm, Executive Director at the uh, US Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law. And this is our regular speaker guest speaker series. As always, I'm gonna start by mentioning our program for next week. Um, on Tuesday, March 28th, we have uh, a guest from uh, Singapore, Liu Nongye, talking about China and the future of the high seas, uh, searching for sustainability. And um, his topic is very timely because as many of you will know, earlier this month, <clears throat> the uh, nations of the world concluded negotiations on a new biodiversity treaty for the high seas. So this is what uh, Professor Liu is going to be talking about and specifically China's role in high seas governance. So today I am thrilled to welcome an old friend from Beijing, Mike Chinoy. Uh, Mike was an award-winning correspondent for CNN from China during the 1980s and 1990s. And then after that for many years reported for CNN from Hong Kong as senior Asia correspondent. And during that time, he frequently traveled into North Korea, uh, reported on the nuclear threat there and all the other top stories in Asia. Um, he is currently a non-resident senior fellow at the University of Southern California, US China Institute, but he lives in Taipei. Uh, we first met in 1987 when we both arrived in Beijing to join the resident press corps. And uh, at that time I was very green, but Mike was already quite, uh, quite experienced because he had been reporting from Hong Kong on China, which was how uh, American correspondents did it for years before the Chinese began to allow US media to set up bureaus in Beijing. And that he had also been a correspondent, a sort of roving foreign correspondent for CNN, which at that time was a brand new uh, cable network and uh, exciting uh, new thing in, in media. He's here today to talk about his new book, Assignment China, uh, an Oral History of American Journalists in the People's Republic. The book grew out of a 12-part documentary series which interspersed interviews with foreign correspondents with archival footage from the events that they covered. And um, transcribing it into a book form must have been very uh, difficult, but it's a quite fascinating uh, story. And I think it is interesting for people who are, could care about China, care about US-China relations, and of course, anybody who's interested in foreign correspondence and, and journalism and journalistic ethics. So with that, I turn it over to you, Mike. Thanks very much, Kathy. It's, it's, it's great to be uh, here. Um, we go back a long way. You're in the book. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I, I owe Kathy and her colleagues uh, in the Associated Press Bureau in Beijing, uh, an enormous debt because when I first arrived in Beijing, there was no housing for foreign correspondents. Uh, so we had to live in a hotel and I was coming from London and we had this uh, Labrador retriever named Sherlock and the, a, a colleague of Kathy's volunteered to let him stay in her flat. So our dog was an AP dog living in an AP flat during my first year in China. So I have particularly sentimental feelings about it. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen now, and uh, what I would like to do is um, to uh, go through some of the sort of interesting themes and issues uh, that are addressed uh, in Simon China and tell you a little bit about the book and uh, make a few share a few thoughts about where things stand today in terms of uh, the situation facing foreign correspondents. So to begin with, I want to hit rewind and go back. 1973, when I made my first trip to China, that's me with a lot more hair that is not gray and the Mao cap on the right-hand side of the photograph. I went with a student group, and one of the places we were taken was the Wusan People's Commune near Shenyang in Northeast China. And that is where I met Yu Kuxin, who was sort of this model Maoist peasant who was presented to us. And um, I had lunch in his home, uh, which was for me really the highlight of the trip. It seemed like the most authentic contact that I could have in, in a tightly regimented uh, tour. Um, so 20 years later in 1993, as CNN's first Beijing bureau chief, I, I retraced the 1973 trip. And the idea was to see what had happened to the places I visited as a way of measuring what had changed in China. So uh, I tracked uh, Yu Kuxin down and I discovered 
that uh, he uh, his life had improved considerably. He had a new apartment. He was running a little workshop with his uh, son uh, uh, repairing tires. Uh, he had a television set. He was clearly a beneficiary of the market style reforms that Deng Xiaoping had introduced. Um, but as soon as the local officials were out of sight, you turned to me and said, basically, almost everything I'd seen in 1973 was an illusion. He said, in fact, conditions at the time were terrible. Uh, he was lucky to eat meat once a month and that the meal that I had so enjoyed had been trucked in the day before by local officials just to impress the foreigners. And so to me, this episode underscores a kind of central theme in this whole discussion about the history and experiences of foreign correspondents who've covered China. And that is the challenge of finding the truth in a vast, complicated country with a long history of distrust of outsiders and an authoritarian, highly secretive political system. This, by the way, is Joe Kahn, who in the 1990s covered China for the Wall Street Journal and then the New York Times, and is today the, the executive editor, the editor-in-chief of the Times. And he's one of the more than 100 people that I interviewed for assignment China. The stakes in all this couldn't be higher because over the decades, reporters for the American media like Evan Osnos here of The New Yorker have played a critical role, profoundly influencing uh, U.S. views of the country as well as the policies of successive American governments. Moreover, because of the reach of American news organizations like CNN and the networks, the AP, the wire services, the New York Times, and so on, uh, this coverage has helped shape perceptions of China around the world. But many, for many consumers of news, however, the way the information they read in newspapers, magazines, or online, or listen to on the radio, or watch on television, actually gets there, remains a mystery. Few people understand what goes into the reporting, the writing, the transmitting of news. This, by the way, is John Pomfret, who was Kathy's colleague at the AP in uh, 1989, interviewing student leaders in Tiananmen Square. As any journalist, however, will agree, the process decisively shapes virtually any news report. And now with China emerging as a global superpower and its relations with the US more strained than in any time in the last 50 years, understanding the people who have covered China for the American media and how they've done so, I think is crucial uh, to helping everyone understand the news they're watching and reading and providing that understanding is really the central goal of Assignment China. The story of the journalists uh, in Assignment China begins with the triumph of Mao Zedong's communist revolution in 1949, at which point virtually all American and other Western journalists were forced to leave the country. Indeed, when Mao proclaimed the establishment of the People's Republic on October 1st, 1949 in Tiananmen Square, not a single American correspondent was there to cover the event. For most of the three decades that followed, American reporters had little choice but to cover China from outside the mainland, most notably from the then British colony of Hong Kong. The China watchers, as they became known, relied primarily on the official Chinese media, which they monitored religiously looking for clues. Bernard Kalb, who sadly passed away recently at the age of 100, was based in Hong Kong for the New York Times and CBS News in the 1950s and 60s. How do we get information about China? We got bits and pieces. We read everything we could. We put the mosaic of pieces together and try to extract some narrative about what was happening in China. But this was bits and pieces journalism. It was indeed a frustrating beat, especially when China was convulsed by upheavals like Chairman Mao's cultural revolution of the mid late 1960s, um, which American correspondents couldn't see for themselves. And it wasn't until Richard Nixon's visit to China in February of 1972 that the door began to open. At that time, China had been cut off from the US for so long that many journalists, even network heavyweights like Dan Rather of CBS News, felt that it was going into like going into outer space. It was a little bit the feeling we're leaving Earth and going deep into the cosmos of some distant planet. In the wake of the Nixon trip, China did become slightly more open. Uh, to Americans and U.S. news organizations slowly began to get greater access. This is Ted Koppel of ABC News and cameraman John Lauer in China in 1973, the year I first went there. But it wasn't until 
uh, the U.S. and China established diplomatic relations in 1979 that American news organizations were finally allowed to open bureaus in Beijing. The interest in China was enormous. When Deng Xiaoping, who by then established himself as the country's senior leader, visited the U.S., the images of him wearing a cowboy hat at a rodeo in Texas cemented this idea that Deng was sort of the cuddly communist and the U.S. And, and then the, cemented this U.S. view of China as a sort of potentially attractive strategic and economic partner for the U.S. The economic reforms that Deng then initiated heightened this perception, which was fueled by the cascade of stories the newly arrived American journals did about the changes underway. Jim Laurie opened the ABC News Beijing Bureau. If you go back and you look at the programming on ABC and NBC and CBS uh, in 1979, that is very much reflected. China opening up. Every little uh, innovation that occurred in the late 70s that were part of the reform program that Deng was outlining were seized upon. The first private restaurant, the first private car, the first of this, the first. It was all a series of firsts. What followed were several decades when the People's Republic became increasingly accessible to American and other foreign journalists, although there were always obstacles and limitations. When I became CNN's first Beijing bureau chief in 1987 and Kathy arrived for the AP, for example, the official regulations required reporters to get permission 10 days in advance for any travel outside Beijing, such as this trip I took with my camera crew to Tibet in 1988. Plus, reporters had to be accompanied by government minders, and contact with ordinary Chinese remained difficult. Melinda Liu, a Chinese-American who opened the Newsweek Bureau because she was ethnically Chinese, would dress like a local to escape the scrutiny of security personnel and have contact with ordinary citizens. But the encounters were often fraught. Fox Butterfield, who was Butterfield, who was the first New York Times correspondent, uh, met a woman who spoke candidly about sexual values in China. He wrote an article which didn't name or identify her, but used some of her insights. But afterwards, the government figured out who she was, and she was put in jail. Richard Bernstein of Time magazine did a story about a prison journal that was smuggled out uh, that had been written by a dissident uh, who'd been jailed for activities around the Beijing's democracy wall. Uh, Bernstein was called in and questioned by police, and the dissident, who had been sentenced to three years, had his sentence increased to 11 years. Still, Deng Xiaoping persisted with the reforms, which included greater engagement with the Western media. In 1986, for example, he gave an interview to Mike Wallace of CBS's 60 Minutes. It was the first time a Chinese leader had done an on-camera interview with foreign television. But the reforming trends alarmed Communist Party hardliners who made repeated attempts to roll them back, periodically launching campaigns against so-called bourgeois liberalization. Dorinda Elliott, who arrived in 1986 for Newsweek, tried to interview a farmer in the countryside about one such campaign. And her experience, I think, gives a good sense of the kind of challenges that journalists faced then. God. And as a journalist, this was firstly no easy thing. You had to go through the foreign affairs office of the you know province, and then it got down to the town level, whatever. By the time I got to the village, I probably had 20, you know, Chinese, you know officials, Communist Party officials following me. And I remember going into this farmer's house and I'm trying to have a conversation with this farmer in Chinese. But in the meantime, you know, like 15 or 20 government officials come into this tiny little house with me and the entire village is basically looking through the window. <laughs> the farmer, the family of farmers are totally terrified, have no idea what's going on. So I turn to this woman and I say, so tell me, you know, what, what do you think about the bourgeois liberalization campaign and, and you know what's going on? And she says, she looks absolutely terrified, doesn't know what to say. And she says, well, the reason that we're supposed to support bourgeois liberalization is because, and you could see the officials saying, no, 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 you're supposed to, you know, you're just supposed to be opposing bourgeois liberalization. And, you know, I felt like, oh my God, what have I done to this poor farmer? With the huge pro-democracy protests in Tiananmen Square and elsewhere, 1989 became a watershed moment, not only in Chinese modern Chinese history, but in the history of media coverage of China. Due to an accident of history, 
the visit by Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev to end the 30-year-long Sino-Soviet dispute, the Chinese authorities wanted extensive coverage. So they gave permission to CNN and other broadcasters to bring in satellite dishes and other transmission equipment. And then the students literally stole the stage on which the Sino-Soviet Soviet summit was supposed to take place. The live broadcasts from that time, and you know, today when it's possible to transmit video live from almost anywhere by an iPhone, it's easy to lose sight of just how unprecedented it was, captured attention around the world. And it presented a picture of China utterly different from the narrative that the Communist Party had long sought to impose on foreign journalists. But on the night of June 3rd and 4th, the army was ordered in to crush the protests. The following day, from the balcony of the Beijing Hotel, a cameraman for CNN named Jonathan Scher and a photographer from the AP named Jeff Widener captured a moment that has become one of the most, uh, that produced one of the most iconic images of our times. Another cameraman said, hey, look at that guy in front of the tank. And I looked at it and said, oh my God, and zoomed in on it and started videotaping it. And they were trying to scare him off by shooting over his head. Well, shooting over his head was basically at, at where our position was. It was the fifth floor, the fourth floor, whatever balcony we were on, but the bullets were so close you could hear them whizzing by. And at that point, we just locked the camera down. It was just too dangerous. There were bullets ricocheting around. So I'm just like waiting for them to get shot and holding the focus on them, waiting and waiting. And it's too far away. And I just, this is too far away. It's too far away. And I look back at the bed and I had that lens doubler, which would make my 400 and 800. And I have to think, do, do I gamble? Do I go back to the bed? Maybe I lose the shot or do I just shoot this? wider so i took a chance and i ran to the bed got it put it on the camera open the aperture up all the way one two three shots this was the result and the image of the man in front of the tank became a symbol of a crackdown which shocked the world and the coverage from Tiananmen produced a sea change in american perceptions of china as the 1990s arrived the u.s press corps largely remained focused on the bitter legacy from 1989 and the atmosphere of repression that still enveloped Beijing. And in such a climate with so much of the story revolving around human rights, many reporters did not initially appreciate the moves by Deng Xiaoping, which started with his so-called Southern tour in 1992 to revive his program of economic reforms. But the attention of the American press corps swiftly shifted to chronicling the dramatic economic, social, and even political changes triggered by the boom. The new atmosphere also led to a significant improvement in conditions for foreign journalists. It became much easier to travel and local officials were much more accessible. Instead of chasing them away, they often asked American journalists for advice about how to attract foreign investment. By the late 90s, the China beat was entering what Keith Richburg of the Washington Post described as a golden age. This is some amazing transformation that's going on in China right now. Beijing was kind of really exploding as uh, it went from being this kind of uh, difficult place for correspondents to live to being actually kind of fun. It was an exhilarating period. China's economy was becoming the manufacturing hub of the world, and American journalists were able to dig into Chinese society in ways that had previously been difficult, if not impossible. Trying to make sense of the paradoxes of a society where you'd one day you'd be covering a jailed dissident, and the next day you'd be covering the opening of the world's largest airport or some Chinese entrepreneur who'd become a millionaire. 2008 was the climax of this period. Uh, that's when Beijing hosted the Summer Olympics. And in the run-up to the games, the government lifted many long-standing restrictions on the movement and activities of foreign correspondents. In the wake of the games, however, China's domestic political climate and its external behavior began to change. The financial crisis that rocked the U.S. and the rest of, of the West in 2008 and 2009 convinced Chinese leaders that the United States was a declining power and that the time was right for Beijing to show a more assertive face to the rest of the world, and that included its treatment of the foreign media. For reporters, covering China became an increasingly tense game of cat and mouse with the authorities. So here's one of many examples. The actor Christian Bale, the star of Batman and other movies, was in China to promote a new film. He wanted to meet the blind dissident lawyer, Chen Guangcheng. Uh, Bale was accompanied by CNN correspondent Stan Grant and a camera crew. 
But outside Chun's village, just a few hours from Beijing, they were set upon by local security personnel. Why can I go? Why can I not go visit this man? Hollywood actor Christian Bale is used to action, but this is no movie We've set. We've been stopped. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Plain clothes Chinese security who would not identify themselves determined to stop him and our crew contacting a detained human rights activist. No, no, watch, watch it, Christian. Watch it. We're trying to get out of here. Once again, we've been stopped. We've been stopped right here. And as you can see, they're, they're pushing Christian here. We're just trying to leave peacefully. We're trying to leave peacefully. Government anger at the U.S. press intensified in 2012 when Mike Forsyth and his colleagues at Bloomberg News produced an expose showing how the relatives of then Vice President Xi Jinping, who was about to become China's top leader, had made millions of dollars in all kinds of previously unknown business and real estate dealings. At the same time, David Barboza of the New York Times used publicly available corporate documents to uncover how the relatives of Premier Wen Jiabao controlled numerous companies and had made millions of dollars. Every time we requested a company, we found 10 more. So if you can imagine this big chart is you have like even with Ping An, Behind Ping An are 30 companies, and then behind those, it ends up any company you look at is like 100 companies. I continued to map out a strategy of how to do it without setting off alarm bells, without letting people know, thinking about who was going to be translating, what I could show people, and also to go around to lawyers, accountants, bankers, and test some of the theories without giving them what I was doing, because that was too sensitive. The stories broke new ground as examples of a new kind of investigative journalism recovering a rapidly changing China. The correspondents took advantage of China's evolution towards a more internationally engaged market-style economy to unravel complex and often hidden business dealings reaching to the highest levels in the People's Republic. Retaliation from Beijing was swift. Mike Forsyth received death threats and had to leave the country. The websites of both Bloomberg News and the New York Times were blocked in China and their reporters had trouble getting visas. Since then, covering China has become an increasingly tense, challenging uh, process as reporters have found themselves regularly tailed, harassed, blocked, even sometimes physically assaulted. Xi Jinping's aggressive campaign to consolidate power in recent years has made conditions for journalists even more difficult. While not as bad as the Mao era, I think the climate for China-based reporters now is more restrictive than at any time since the country embarked on its uh, reform process and, and established diplomatic relations with the U.S. in the late 1970s. At the same time, Xi Jinping has further tightened Communist Party control over Chinese society, and he changed party policies to allow him to effectively rule for life. High-level Chinese politics were always opaque, secretive, and a challenge to figure out, and they become even more so. Indeed, even though China is in some ways more open and accessible now than in the Mao years, Xi and other leaders travel, hold meetings, he's been gone and spoken at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and so on, our knowledge of the inner workings at the pinnacle of power today is arguably less than during Mao's time. Nonetheless, American reporters have persisted in doing what they could, and that has actually been quite a lot including exposing the massive campaign of repression targeting Uyghur Muslims in uh, Xinjiang in the far west, coverage which helped make Chinese government policy in Xinjiang into a major international issue. But conditions for reporters continued to deteriorate. In 2019, the Foreign Correspondents Club of China released its annual report in which 82% of those surveyed said they'd experienced some kind of interference or harassment or violence 43% said physical surveillance affected their reporting, and 70% said that interviews that they'd set up had been canceled due to actions taken by the Chinese authorities. Access shrank further during the early days of COVID, when 20 journalists for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal were expelled. Those kicked out included Chow Dung of the Wall Street Journal and Chris Buckley of the Times, both of whom had gone to Wuhan at the very beginning of the outbreak and stayed throughout the lockdown, providing crucially important reporting at a very, very sensitive time. Beijing justified the expulsions as a response to a decision by the Trump administration to cap the number of staff at four state-run Chinese media outlets in the US. 
but the move decimated the U.S. press corps in China. With just a handful of reporters there now, that has largely meant having to cover China from outside the country. So a kind of modern day version of the art of China watching that emerged in Hong Kong in the 1950s has become increasingly important. Here, I wanna make a brief digression to recall the work of the man generally considered in the field to have been the greatest of all China watchers, Father Laszlo Ladani. Ladani was a Hungarian Jesuit priest who lived and worked in China in the 1940s. After being forced to leave and moving to Hong Kong, for more than 30 years, he published a weekly newsletter called the China News Analysis, which became the Bible for multiple generations of journalists, myself included. It was based entirely on his reading and interpretation of the official Chinese media, newspapers, radio broadcasts. Um, fluent in Chinese, he mastered the art of deciphering the real meaning behind the rhetoric, the jargon, the slogans, the obscure historical references and dubious statistics pumped out by the Communist Party. This approach to analyzing China still largely holds true today. Here's a tweet from Fordham University China scholar Carl Minzer from a couple of weeks ago, which provides a good example of, of how it works now. Minzer was uh, noting how the references to Xi Jinping in the state media uh, sourced to various top officials and the use of the re references to being at the helm, the helmsman, um, which is terminology that previously was used uh, almost only for Mao. So it was a, a further sign of Xi tightening his grip. But today there are tools and resources beyond just trying to, uh, to decipher the state-run press. These include monitoring the Chinese internet, which despite censorship can provide critical insights. One recent example was this New York Times piece. It collected the obituaries publicly uh, posted online since 2019 on the websites of the Chinese Academy of Engineering and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And what the Times reporters discovered was that while there were usually three or four obituaries every month, once the Chinese government abandoned zero, the zero COVID policy last December, the number of obituaries shot up dramatically. It was really a terrific reporting and I think provided powerful evidence that the government's death toll, the official death toll, didn't reflect a much grimmer reality. Indeed, there are now a whole host of online publications exclusively devoted to following the Chinese internet and the Chinese media more broadly. They include, among others, What's on Weibo, which is run by a Dutch China specialist, uh, charting what's on the Chinese version of Twitter. Cynicism, published by American China expert Bill Bishop, which offers summaries analysis links to major Chinese media uh, stories, and the China Media Project, which does something similar. Also increasingly important has been commercially available satellite imagery. This was critical in documenting and uncovering the detention camps in Xinjiang. More recently, reporters used satellite images to document an unusually high activity, unusually high activity of crematoriums around China. Um, if you look in this, uh, picture on the right hand side, this is a crematorium near, uh, outside Beijing. On the right, you can see a lot of cars in the parking lot. The left hand side, it's the same place, but with almost no cars in the parking lot. The only difference is picture on the left was taken in early December. Picture on the right was taken at the end of December. And in between, the only thing that had happened was the government had ended the zero COVID policy and the death toll spiked. So that is an important journalistic tool. In addition, we're, we're seeing the growing importance of AI, such as this newsletter produced by two China watchers in Hong Kong called Five Things on China's Leaders' Minds. The newsletter uses software that can analyze web content for any key word, sector, or individual to determine how often the material appears. So it's, it's a way of showing uh, what's preoccupying key leaders and also what they want people going down through the system to be uh, thinking about. Moreover, China's um, growing international involvement is also providing opportunities for reporters. One recent example was this long Wall Street Journal piece about problems in construction projects in the Belt and Road Initiative. The reporters talked to people in Peru, Pakistan, Angola, Uganda, and elsewhere. Interestingly, although they requested comment from Chinese embassies, companies, and the central government, no one was willing to speak with them. And this cuts to one issue that has long affected American and other foreign news coverage of China, 
And that's the continued unwillingness of Chinese authorities to engage in meaningful ways with reporters. As you can see from this example, and there are countless others, correspondents generally try hard to get the Chinese perspective, but their requests for interviews or access are routinely rebuffed. So the upshot is that many stories are unlikely to contain as extensive or nuanced a portrayal of, Chinese, of the Chinese perspective, but that's usually not the fault of the reporter. Nor is it a function of bias, despite the claims one so often hears from Beijing and its supporters about how the Western media is biased, that it's anti-China, that it has an agenda to defame China and so on. In fact, as I've indicated, responsible reporters try to get input from all sides on important stories, but they have to do their jobs and they'll end up putting the story out with whatever material um, they can gather by their filing deadline. The Chinese side won't engage, it has only itself to blame. Um, there's another reason though, I think, for, for the tension between the American and Western press, the Chinese authorities, and that has to do with the nature of journalism itself. At its finest, the role of journalism in the US and the West has been to shine a light in dark places, to hold the powerful accountable, to be a voice for the voiceless. You hear those phrases often. Um, and this is true for a correspondent, whether he or she is in London or Washington or Nairobi or Delhi or Beijing. And that's one reason why so many governments don't like the press. And I think in China, there is a clash between the Chinese Communist Party's impulse for its total control and our notion of what good journalism is. And in fact, it's worth emphasizing that this is not just a Western notion. In Asia, for instance, you have a relatively free press in South Korea, in Japan, in Taiwan. You had it in Hong Kong before China imposed uh, its draconian national security law. You even see it in the Philippines where my old friend and former CNN colleague Maria Ressa won the Nobel Peace Prize for her efforts to report on issues the authorities there didn't want covered. So it's not a function, in my view, of reporters being, quote, anti-China. Indeed, I would say that most of the journalists who appear in assignment China really like China. For them, China was a passion. It was a calling. I know in my own case that was true. I was entranced by China long before I became a journalist. I became a journalist because in the mid-1970s, as an American, that seemed to be one of the few career paths that offered a possible chance to go and spend time in China. Most journalists who spend the time to learn Chinese, study the country, and agree to live there and to bring their families there. I moved there with a four-month-old, as one example. Despite all the difficulties, don't do so because they hate China. They do it because they like it. They're fascinated by it, and they want to experience it. So I think one of the most unfortunate consequences of the sharp drop in American media access to China is the ability of reporters who are basically positively disposed towards the people of China to go around the country, to talk to folks and witness for themselves what's going on. That's been severely limited. Being there is the essential foundation for good journalism, and that's become harder and harder to do. The result is that even that more and more the coverage is becoming focused on the tensions and conflicts driving China and the U.S. apart since the official statements, uh, diplomatic and sometimes military maneuvering is usually easier to uh, chart and to report on. But what's increasingly missing is the ability of journalists to convey the richness and complexity of the world's most populous nation, the shared humanity that I think is also essential to understand, especially now at, when the US and China are lurching ever closer to confrontation. So thank you so much. That was fantastic. and. Uh... I could have watched another half hour or so of those old images because um, the mesmerizing, their history that many of us remember and lived through, and they're very evocative and very powerful. Um, simple question, just to start off the discussion. Do you know how many American journalists are inside China now on a permanent basis? Roughly? I, I, I don't have a number, but uh, you know, the, I think the New York Times had well over a dozen, and I think they have two. Uh -huh. The Wall Street Journal, I was talking to someone from the Wall Street Journal the other day. Um, I think they had 14 and they now have three. Uh -huh. um, the, the networks all have like a reporter. Um, I, I think Bloom, Bloomberg and the financial press has a little bit more, but it's not, it's not a lot. And the problem is 
it's such a big country and it's such a big story. It's hard to cover even if you have 15 people in your bureau. If you have two, if you just have a couple of people, um, so much is happening that you have to, you know, the, the foreign ministry briefings, the official statements, all of that. Um, you you have so that's one factor. Then it's not easy to travel, both because uh, officials don't are are unwelcoming, and, and there's another phenomenon which is the Chinese media has been full of uh, you know this line for a number of years about foreign journalists are all spies and so on. So uh, reporters encounter openly hostile people, even when it's not just a case of the authorities saying no 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 you can't do it. Um, there are cases where reporters get surrounded by really ugly crowds just because they're foreign journalists and they think they're they're spies. So you put all that together, the chance to go around the country to like spend 10 days in a Chinese village and talk about rural life, which used to be doable, not all the time. I'll give you, I'll give it, it, does, it doesn't exist. One, one interesting story in Assignment China, Kathy Chen of the Wall Street Journal uh, wanted to do a story about 93, 94, about the migration of people from the countryside to the coastal areas to work in all the joint venture factories. Um, and she got the foreign affairs office in Sichuan to help her. Mm -hmm. And they arranged for her they, uh, to go to a village and connected her with some young women. And she rode on a bus from Sichuan to Guangdong, a, a five day of young women being car sick out the window. She, she described <laughs> it, but she got a fantastic story about this dynamic. Then because she was Chinese, uh, Chinese American, she looked the same. She was able to sneak into their dormitory and they all went to work making Mattel dolls, Barbie dolls or something like that. That would be next to impossible to do now. And so we're losing that sense of the texture of Chinese life that is so important to, uh, to, to give a broader picture than this one dimensional, just the China is the evil empire. Not that there aren't very serious issues, but it's a more complicated country than that. And we're not getting that. Yeah. So now we know that a lot of those New York Times correspondents who were expelled, the Wall Street Journal ones, they're reporting from Taipei about China, or they're reporting from South Korea, uh, or other, you know, for a while, some have been reporting from as far away as the US or Australia. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed changes, shifts um, in, you know, obviously we're missing mm -hmm. that story about what it's like to be uh, a migrant worker in Shenzhen. Right. But what else do you, do, you, do you notice changes in the tone of the articles? Is there the language that reporters use do you see shifts? i don't i don't know if it's i mean you know good reporters are going to just report mm -hmm. straight it's just what they're reporting on is the stuff that is sort of you can you can cover without being there in the same way i i was chatting yesterday with the, the wall street journal has like a, a couple of people one in new york one in washington who are just doing china mm -hmm. from here um so uh, we were at dinner last night and he sent me a note this morning saying after he went back to, from dinner, he had to work because Chinese police had raided the offices of this um, uh, mince uh, um, consulting firm that does due diligence for Western companies and arrested five of their employees. So I guess he was like on the phone calling for reaction and stuff like that. Um, so it's partly that's what's coverable and it's partly that's what's happening. and the the fact that there's other stuff that you could report about if you could travel and so on but you can't means that the weight shifts mm -hmm. so i don't think it's a tone um it's more it's chronicling a very rough patch in 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 us china relations and in china's relations with the mess west more generally that's what gets the attention hmm. you you were talking at the end about the role of journalism in shining a light on power, corruption. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is what we say in the States, that journalism is a central part of the democratic enterprise. But when you're a foreigner in another country, do you think there's any change in what your responsibilities are, or what your role is? Or, you know, do you believe that it is exactly the same? I think that, I mean, if you believe in a free press, you, you, Want, you know, you want to do it responsibly. It doesn't give you license to do nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, 
uh, you're not going to go to China and say, because China doesn't have a free press, I'm not going to cover any critical issues. That's, you know, when your job is to cover the news as you as a perfect journalist um, see it. But I, I mean, I do feel that, you know, journalism is a craft and it has certain values and you have certain responsibilities uh, to, in, in the way in which you, you report and, and, and you carry those with you everywhere and you try to apply them so you're not you're not going in with like an agenda that i'm going to trash this place because i don't like it or trash that place I'm, you're going in and you're 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 trying to figure out what the news is and report it and one of the things that i, I that i think is valuable about simon china is to get a sense of sort of what what it's like i think people outside the media world don't really ha you hear all these stories you know the media has an agenda or you know that it's being driven by this or that um the reality as you know you were there i was there you wake up in the morning well, what am i going to file today and who can i interview to get my story and oh god the deadline is in three hours uh and you know at, at cnn it's like it's going to take 45 minutes to drive to the TV station. So we only have two hours and 15 minutes and the editor is fixated on one shot. And so he's not going to edit the package in time. And, um, you know, and then you do this and then you discover that the OJ Simpson car chase is on in your story, which was going to be the second ended up being the last. And there are all these things. There's an old joke that two things you don't want to see the inside of are a sausage factory and a newsroom. And for the same reason, because the process is messy. And I don't think people appreciate that. There's no master plan here. Um, and, 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 and I think if you read Simon China, you'll get a sense over multiple decades of how that dynamic affected the experiences and, and, uh, and, and coverage of the people of the 120 plus people who are in the book. Well, one thing that uh, occurs to me that has possibly shifted where journalists, foreign journalists, American foreign journalists look mm -hmm. when they're in another country, including China, right. is the rise of social media, which you talked about as well. Um, and the fact that you do have non-journalists who are just interested parties, you know, who share that passion and interest mm -hmm. for anything new or different that yeah. may be occurring in the social scene. And they have a different set of priorities maybe or just a different set of tastes and they will highlight things and then that may come to the attention of the professionals or the mm -hmm. official media so I, I i think that the scope of what is covered is widened a little bit more it it seems to bring to the attention of the professionals things that they might otherwise say well that's yeah. kind of trivial you know like that soft side stuff yeah. the cultural thing the funny dance or the funny movie video that's yeah. out it, you're absolutely I, you're absolutely right and i think particularly given how few how hard it is to work you know on the ground in china i mean all the china reporters are scouring the chinese internet chinese social media and they're picking up yeah they're you're, you can pick up trends uh sometimes you can see something and you can actually you know, send a message, get a contact who not necessarily that people always respond. Um, and and also the internet means like, um, you know, tenders for construction projects get put on the internet so you can find out where the police in City X want to build a new building and for what. Or, I mean, it, and there's a whole chapter in the book called The Surveillance State in the Simon China, in which the journalists who sort of had the tech beat talk about how they use the, the internet. Um, some one one of the one of the reporters uh, talked about how they found a journal online on some website that some teacher who was working in Xinjiang had posted uh, talking about how uh, these little kids were crying for their parents and how hard it was for him to comfort them. So she went to Xinjiang and she went to that school. And of course, the reason they were crying for their parents is their parents were in detention camps. So it's an amazing tool. The problem is, um, you know, there are even with censorship, people can say all kinds of stuff. And outside of China, nothing will nothing is stopping me doing a tweet saying spaceship with little green creatures just landed outside NYU mm. and it will, you know go all over before it gets discredited. So you have to be very careful with it and try and vet it and follow up. And 
you know, the the it's better to be late and right than run with something because you saw it on the internet that it's wrong. And I think the temptation in this sort of instant news era uh, to do that, uh, particularly given the weaponization of news by, you know, different governments, political forces in, in, in multiple countries, the pressure on journalists to be careful about that is really hot, but it is a fantastic tool. Hmm. So I'm going to start taking questions in a minute. And also from those of you online, I'm going to as well be looking for your questions. Um, one last one of my own is, what has been the impact of the change in who the journalists are? So the early pictures, uh, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. White middle-aged men. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and later on, we have a lot of well, younger people, it seems to me, um, women, of course, and a lot more people who are Asian or Asian descent, mm -hmm. uh, some actually Chinese born, mm -hmm. um, native speakers, uh, very good levels of Chinese. Yeah. Um, how has that shaped the content I, and substance of what they're reporting on? Well, the the you're absolutely right. The composite, particularly by like the mid-teens, there were a lot of ethnic Chinese, Chinese Americans, mm -hmm. Chinese Canadians, Chinese Australians, people born in China and come to the States as kids, people whose parents were, came to the States. Um, uh, Ching Ching Ni of the LA Times, who's, who's in Assignment in China, was the first person born in the People's Republic, born in Beijing, came to the States, became an American citizen, then went back to China as a foreign correspondent. And obviously they bring certain skills and, and perspective that's absolutely invaluable. And of course, they can blend in. And so you get, for example, I think it was Amy Chin of the New York Times did a story about um, trafficking in uh, brides. Mm. Uh, and she, she, she went to this village and the villagers all thought like she was just another young woman there to be trafficked. So she got this incredible, somebody who looked like me would never in a million years. And you can blend in. So you get reporting of things that would be much harder to get access to. But that also carries risks because if you can blend in, the police don't know that you're working for a, a major American media organization. And there's in, 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 the, in Assignment China, a number of journalists encounters, you know, talk, uh, recount scary mm -hmm. encounters with the, with the police who, until they realized that it was not a PRC citizen and, and was actually working for a major American media outlet, they had very frightening treatment, but it it it, uh, and it's not an accident that ha that a lot a lot of the people who were kicked out in 2020 were ethnic Chinese, mm -hmm. and think, it's a real loss. I think you said in your book about half of them. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, questions from the room. Yes. Thanks. Uh, thanks for a comprehensive uh, explanation of the your creative of past decades. So I do have a, a question that bothered me for a long time. So. On the one hand, I'm quite sympathetic with the uh, limitations, prohibitions, mm -hmm. and also harassment, as, uh, as you have mentioned, the foreign correspondents have suffered in China over the past decades. But on the other hand, I am under the impression that the foreign correspondents could also play a very critical role from the perspective of the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. So two examples might occur in my mind. One, as you mentioned, that uh, I think that is New York Times coverage by Wen Davos. Uh, financial empire with mm -hmm. Ping An 10 years right. ago in 2012, just against the backdrop of the uh, of the crackdown of Bo Xilai and Zhou right. Kang among others. Another more recent one might be the um, latest 20th Party Congress that the uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, they cracked to identify six candidates in the standing committee of the political bureau. So people would say that it would be impossible for foreign correspondent to collect such comprehensive and accurate materials without the help from the political dissidents. For mm -hmm. example, from Zhou yeah. Hong Kong, West right. Lai, Jiang's background against right. Wen Jiabao, mm -hmm. and also the so-called anti-Shis right. uh, power, if any, in the latest uh, uh, 20th Party Congress. Right. So my question here for you is, how do you observe and comment on such a observation right. or just a guess about either, especially when the um, very critical political dynamics before or during the um, party congress every five years, mm -hmm. some of the critical moments uh, for the new candidates or some of the uh, internal struggles. How would you observe and further elaborate about the dynamics 
with the role one, on, on the one hand of the Communist Party, and on the other hand, that how they can take advantage or right. rely on the help uh, of the foreign correspondent. It's, it's, I know, I mean, a lot of people in China wondered about that. Um, for what it's worth, the reporters swear that they got their information from documents. Um, and, uh, you know, there is not a tradition of leaks in the CCP the way there's a tradition of leaks in Washington. Uh, and and every time I see a story in the, uh, from Washington, that according to anonymous sources, my immediate reaction is, what's the content then? Who leaked it? Why did they leak it today? What's going on? But, um, you know, if you read the chapter in Assignment China about the, like the Forsyth and Barboza, uh, what happened was the, the um, Barboza had started in like two, you know, he kept going to meetings and dinners and, you know, just kept hearing about Wen Jiabao's family. So he started digging and, you know, he, he they had this sort of state administration of something in commerce and the, the files were open. You could just get them. You could just say, I want to file about Ping on. And in file on ping on, there's a reference to some stock offering, and you know you follow up that way. Um, Foresight started working on the Xi Jinping thing um, because they felt they'd been scooped by the Wall Street Journal's reporting about Bo Xilai's wife's business deals, uh, and they wanted to do something. And it was one of these sort of, you know, aha moments where. You know, they went to corporate records in Hong Kong and discovered that there were names in the corporate records and Hong Kong IDs that looked like it matched family names. And then they just went, you know, and asked. So I think I, 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 the, the Communist Party doesn't have the tradition of leaking. And I think it, it's, 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 it's uh, you know, these are very resourceful business reporters. They know how to read a balance sheet. They know how to do all this. They know how to make sense of all this stuff. I've seen the documents that Forsyth used. It's like multiple, you know, huge suitcase full of documents. And, and they just went through them and they made the connections. And so it's just very enterprising reporting. Um, and I think particularly now, given the hostility towards the press, the notion that anybody senior is going to like just quietly call the New York Times and say, well, let me tell you, these six guys are in line. I just, I don't think that's reflective of the atmosphere at the elite politics level. Um, the journalists would be thrilled. I mean, they would be so happy if that happened, but it, I don't think it does. Okay, so first Jifeng and then Kathy. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chiu, uh, for the talk. So my question is about the spread of Hong Kong. And I wonder if we have we ever thought of um well, what's your opinion on um like a relatively ideal balance in um in Hong Kong given the you know regarding the press freedom given Hong Kong's history as mm -hmm. one of the hardest global spy hub. Right. So there's a need for any government to curb or suppress such spy activities, mm -hmm. but also you know, on the other hand. Uh, Hong Kong is used to um, a lot more press freedom than now. Right. So I guess, um, would, do you think would there be uh, some sort some sort of balance between you know the government government's um, control or making sure that there's less spy activity, but also um, press people are able to do their job, right. and if there's no if um, the current situation continues to worsen for the I guess, press people, mm -hmm. what would um, be an implication for, I guess, um, reporting on China on a mm -hmm. larger scale? Well, I would push back very strongly on the notion that journalists are spies. You're absolutely right that in the 50s and 60s, the 70s, that the British and the Americans had uh, large uh, intelligence gathering. I mean, the, there used to be, you could go s look at the, these huge antennas in uh, out near Shaokiwan in Hong Kong that were designed to like listen to, uh, it's not, uh, you know, monitor radio broadcast. And back then the British and the Americans produced reams of transcripts of radio broadcasts. And, um, you know, journalists, you know, you wanted to have 
some contact with the intelligence people because they had access to information. But I would push back very strongly on the notion that the journalists were in any way spies. I mean, some journalists, I mean, journalists collect information. Uh, the difference between you know me and a CIA agent is when I was a journalist, every every piece of information I put on CNN. CIA doesn't do that, okay? So there's a real, but you're both at you. They both you know journalists and spies and diplomats and business people. They all know what's going on, who's up, who's down. Um, they're not going to just take bland official statements at face value. So. Um, I think the 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 uh, in, you know the the destruction of a free press in Hong Kong um, under the guise of uh, protecting state security has nothing to do with state security except the Communist Party defines uh, people who write things or say things or broadcast things that it doesn't like as threats to state security. Um, but the, and, and that's they've 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 made charges against journalists in Hong Kong based on the fact that they may have had connections uh, uh, with foreigners that are, in my view, are completely preposterous. And the foreign press in Hong Kong, they're not spies, they're journalists out for a good story. But it's very easy to say, oh, he's a foreigner, he's asking questions about who's up, who's down, what's going on, they're a spy. Um, but, but, uh, they're not, they're journalists. That's what journalists do. And, 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 and the fact that this government or that company or this powerful individual doesn't like their, uh, multi-million dollar business dealings that their wife has done that nobody knows about to be made public. That's their problem. Yes. A, a research question. How, how do reporters or researchers now um, access material of Chinese press coverage, press coverage, government coverage that would have appeared in, let's say, the 60s or 70s? 60s, of course, with the Cultural Revolution, mm -hmm. very difficult. But for example, in um, the cultural world, if I'm looking for any evidence of a debate in the early 70s, you know, the time of the rapprochement, you know, ping pong, Philadelphia right. Orchestra, et cetera, of whether China should be opened up, whether right. foreign groups should be allowed in. Where does one find that information? These days? I don't know how openly that would have been debated, but there are plenty of uh, universities that have collections. The university's services center in Hong Kong had this fantastic collection. I'm not sure what its fate is now under the national security law, but that's you know, uh, when I first went to Hong Kong in the mid '70s, it had already for many years been the place where scholars, if you wanted to peruse the, you know, Guangdong Rubao from the early 1960s, they had it. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, but it's a kind of a big fishing expedition. There isn't one mm -hmm. repository, and of course, you know, it's not digitized or not much digitized. So you just have to fish around. What what kind of archives would the ministries have kept? I mean, would there be a... Gover Chinese government ministries? Right. Oh, yes, they have exactly. archives. They just won't they let archives. you into them. Right. <laughs> right. And, and sadly, I mean, you know, I mean, right? more, more, more broadly, you know, there was a period where like American academics were able to go to China and do field work and do surveys. That's all gone away. Are, are Chinese academics able to do that? that? I, I doubt that within very tight constraints, but there are certainly people who did really interesting work on all sorts of things based on, you know, getting access. And and that's that's largely shut down now, which is tragic. And it's nothing to do with what's on page one of the New York Times. Right. It's just our understanding of how the society works. I mean, I think in some ways, you know, we know less about what is really going on in China now than in a very, very long time. I mean, so few people are traveling and uh, the journalists aren't traveling that that there could be all kinds of amazing things, good and bad, going on out there that we just don't know about. Mm -hmm. There was something you just said oh, uh, in response to Zerfang's question about Hong Kong, where you, you, you mentioned how businessmen also want information. Sure. Businesses need information. And they will pay for it, of course. So we have 
And this, I think, has sprung up post 1960s, 70s. This is very much a product of the last few decades where you have a myriad of, of companies that offer information for sale to subscribers right. only, right. whether it's, you know, it, it starts with the American Chamber of Commerce, even where, you know, are you a member? And right. Can yeah. you get the information that's that's circulated there to all of the expensive newsletters that sell for $10,000 sure. a sure. year? And there's been a trend because of the instability in the journalism profession for very good journalists to go work sure. for these types of outfits so that there's actually a lot of information that is produced that is not made public anymore that is only available to wealthy subscribers or right. relatively yeah. wealthy subscribers or possibly libraries. Um, that, I think, is having an impact in the sense that information is being siloed. Have you given any thought to what that means that, you know, if... It's, it's the best investigative journalists are are writing for risk assessment companies, right. financial inquiry right. companies like the one that was right. just as you mentioned rated by. I mean, it's a it's a valid point, and it's it's as you say, it's a function of the really dislocated economics of the news business, which mm -hmm. is is catastrophic in so many ways. And, and, um, I don't know how it's going to all um, end up. Um, I think some of that is, they're probably very interesting insights. Um, some of it is probably more detailed than most mainstream media. I mean, you know, you're at the AP, what was your average story length? 800 words? Oh, no, shorter. <laughs> shorter. Okay, so if you're writing a 35-page report about yeah. something, for your corporate client, it's a, it's a different sort of thing, um, but it's a problem. I mean, there you know th there are still the mainstream media outlets, but um, they're under terrible budget pressures. Uh, I think it'll be interesting to see with China emerging as the big new foreign policy issue for the U.S. Whether news organizations are now going to hire more China people just because you got it, but they're hiring China people because we're in conflict with China. They're not hiring them because, I mean, I remember years ago um, having a uh, coffee with a friend who was a senior executive at CNN. I'd already left CNN in 2008, nine, And I said to him, I said, you know, you you can make decisions on programming. China's really important. This is before all the, you know, current mess. Um, I said, China's really important. See, uh, couldn't you mandate once a week on a Thursday night, just Anderson Cooper show on CNN, you do four minutes on China every week. And it doesn't have to be hot, sexy expose. Just give people a sense of what China is like. And he said, it's a great idea. You'll never sell. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, you know, it's a problem. And I think all you can do is, you know, you, you just fight the good fight as best you can. Well, that's the problem with the gatekeepers now that you're talking yeah. about, which has always been there. What do yeah. the editors want? Right. What do the producers or the, exactly. the people who make the decisions exactly. in, in the home office want? Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you for an interesting question, and I really appreciate it. You kind of like taking us back from like all the different administrations who kind of uh, lived under what you were doing first on it in China. And, I'm really curious about your opinion on the new direction of um, digital journalism, especially oh, uh, like dig digital journalism and new forms of journalism. And I thought it was really interesting to mention how the part that impacted me the most in the trip was the textures, like the exchange of like culture just yeah. in the food yeah. and very tiny aspects. And it's really interesting also you brought up um, using Hong Kong as kind of like a China watcher because yesterday in Congress, um, I'm sure you've heard maybe some remarks about the CEO of TikTok being um, kind of Robert. This thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I wish he spoke a little bit more, but he brought on this discussion, um, a lot of points being um, and is actually an opportunity for a lot of people to find their own communities and kind of take down all these barriers of like, going through our editors and going through right. all the big news platforms to offer people a very authentic view of whatever they might come out. 
So, so like precautions being set up and there's um, issues are maybe similar to the ones in the public Cambridge Analytica. But I'm just really curious as to what your opinion of these new forms of journalism. Um, well, the, you know, I still think, as I said, journalism is, as I see it, is a craft and it has certain principles and guidelines. And there are all these amazing new tools, but I don't think I think if it's to me, if it's journalism, you still want to apply that. And, and um, you know, I don't know whether TikTok qualifies as journalism. And, and I mean, the thing that the thing that all this technological change has done is it empowered everybody with a cell phone to broadcast their whatever they want. And on the one hand, I think that's fantastic. It democratizes the process. It circumvents layers of bureaucracy and so on. Um, but for all the fights we may have had with our editors, um, they're also there for a reason. They're there to challenge you. They're there to make sure when you say this, are you really sure? Uh, what's your documentation? You say that you have an anonymous source, so we're not going to publish it, but tell me who it is so I can... Um, you know, we, we had at CNN, it was called The Row, and they were when you wrote a script for your story, you had to go through The Row. And I, I can honestly say I almost never had anyone challenge me because they didn't like the thrust of the story. It's too negative, too positive. But they did say, you know, your third paragraph isn't well written compared to the second one. Or if you're going to say this, you should really get video of that. Or you need a soundbite from so-and-so to you know, so, 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 and, and that's part of the structure um, and that's good. Although you can also have editors who, who will put a stupid headline on a story or who don't want a story, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's an endless, you know, endless ongoing fight. And it's interesting to, when you read Simon China, you have lots of journalists talking about those kinds of, of decisions. But ultimately, if it's journalism, it need, you know, it need, it's it's different than just my personal expression because I can point my cell phone and put it out on whatever. Another distinction that maybe is sometimes lost is between the commentators and mm -hmm. the columnists, right? So uh, cable news, especially MSNBC or CNN even, or... Uh, Fox or whatever, with the commentators yeah. and their own personal shows, right. which are quasi-entertainment, uh, or the opinion page writers versus the reporters. And that's a distinction that the Chinese Communist Party chooses not to get. And in the case of the expulsions in 2020, and there's a chapter in the book, Simon China, about it, the expulsions of the Wall Street Journal correspondents came after Walter Russell Mead mm -hmm. the, wrote an op-ed piece which was given the uh, headline, The Sick Man of China, or The Asia. Sick Man of Asia, I'm sorry, which of course was this horribly pejorative that Westerners used to describe China in the late 1800s when the country was kind of falling apart. And it was gratuitously offensive. But the Wall Street Journal's opinion page, there is a, 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 an ironclad distinction the opinion page has their own editors. They make their own decisions. They have no impact on what news coverage is. And news people, the news side, can't do anything about the opinion side. But there was a petition, and 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 the people who signed it talk about it in the in Simon China, signed by reporters and editors in the field, saying, "This is really offensive, and we don't want to be associated with it. Can you take it down?" And the editorial page said, it's editorial. You could say what we want. And the Chinese foreign ministry made a huge fuss about that. And of course, it gave them a perfect excuse. So they punished the Wall Street Journal by kicking out reporters who had nothing to do with and had opposed the op-ed piece that Walter Russell Mead wrote with the headline, The Sick Man of Asia. Um, and I mean, I had it at CNN. We had idiots at CNN blathering on about this and that who were pundits and commentators. And I would routinely get complaints from the, and I said, sorry, that's an opinion show. I don't, I wouldn't do that. It's not my job, but it exists. But the, it's blurred, it's in, especially in the cable news environment now. Um, it's completely blurred to the point of meaninglessness on the Fox side. 
And it's somewhat blurred on the MSNBC side mm -hmm. and even a bit on the CNN side, although the new president boss of CNN is trying to shift that away. Um, but anchors were like, you know, da da da, da here's so and so with the report. And then they pontificate about it afterwards. I don't like that. I mean, I, I started my broadcast career at CBS News in Hong Kong in the heyday of Walter Cronkite, you know, just the facts. And so I'm very uncomfortable with all this, but that's a trend and it, it it's problematic and it certainly affects uh, perceptions of the Chinese government and I suppose of other governments who can't tell the distinction between the reporter who's on at the top of the hour and the pundit who comes on at 14 minutes after the hour voicing often silly or ignorant opinions. Hmm. So I want to take a question from the online audience. Sure. Um, so you had made a, a, a comment earlier, or you responded to a question earlier about leaks and whether whether foreign journalists are being fed information side. And the question is based on, um, you know, relevant to that, what is your view of the, the Reuters report about how Li Qiang, the new prime minister, um, allegedly stood up to Xi Jinping to end COVID zero, uh, zero COVID um, policy. That, I, 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 that yeah. report caught my eye at yeah. the time because yeah. it seemed curiously timed. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, the fact that th this is not something that is commonly done doesn't mean it's never done. Uh, in fact, there were definitely leaks from within the system uh, saying nasty things about Bo Xi Lai in, in the early 2012. And, you know, reporters never reveal their sources. So I, 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 even years later, people wouldn't tell me who. Obviously, the Reuters folks talk to people who, you know, claim to have knowledge. And I, I respect the Reuters people. So I don't think they, have, I, I don't doubt that people told them stuff. Um, whether I would run with it as categorical or not, I just don't know. That's part of the problem. You don't know what they saw to I don't, substantiate I, it. Well, you know, if somebody that you if somebody that you know who's a very senior, well placed person or who's uh, you know got a relative or I mean, you never know how these things work, and you're you're grabbing for everything. And sometimes these things do come together. I'm not so as I said, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it never happens. Um, it does happen occasionally, um, but can we be, you know, in the case of like Xi Jinping and Wen Jiabao's relatives, we had pieces of paper, you know, uh, purchase documents for Xi Jinping's relative, I forgot what, sister, whatever, ownership of a multi-million dollar uh, luxury apartment in Repulse Bay in Hong Kong, categorically true. So that, in this case, very interesting. You factor it into your assessments, but is it, Gospel truth? I, I I don't know. I'm not saying they made it up. I absolutely don't think they made it up. Somebody they respected enough to, as well informed, told them this stuff. Um, but that's that's what it is. Right, right. Well, the document part. You know, we was talking about information getting becoming harder to access, like archives being shut down and so on. There's a feedback loop there, right? Because um, and has responded to the fact that right. Bloomberg right. and uh, Wall Street Journal and the New York Times were able to use right. corporate documents right. to find ownership records right. and so on. And they have shut down right. a lot. And, of and in Hong Kong, too. Yeah, in, in Hong, Hong Kong, Kong as, as because a lot of these companies right. did go through Hong Kong right. one way or another. So yeah. there is a feedback loop that yeah. responded to it. Yeah, making, making it harder yet again. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't mean reporters aren't going to beaver away anyway and come up with stuff. There were some you, had, you had a question. Over here. And I think it was a, it was a production. And the comment is, um, I think the whole problem about reporting more on the politics of the Chinese government rather than the humanity of the Chinese people is not only a problem, a foreign um, journalist problem, it's also a problem within China. Because now I think 
even the Chinese ourselves have a broken image of our own identities and okay. and the nationality yeah. after COVID. Mm -hmm. um, because so many of us were uh, oppressed um, right. on WeChat, on all kinds right. of social media. So that's just a color. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I mean, there, for example, I mean, there, there, there are various sort of, you know, I can assure you that no one in the Politburo called me up and said, here's our take on the U.S. now. But, for example, when Obama went to China in 2009, and he came into office with this notion of sort of having a really collegial relationship. And if you read the writings of Jeff Bader, who was his main Asia guy, talked about all sorts of areas they could cooperate. Um, the people who people who were covering that trip, and in, in Simon China, they talk about this. Obama was treated uh, insultingly badly. Uh, things he wanted to do, they wouldn't let him do. They wouldn't you know, the, the places he wanted to speak, they wouldn't, you know, they just treated him like a little kid, you know, brand new guy, you know, young, inexperienced, leading a country that's just been through a complete mess. And 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 it was it was kind of humiliation. And it's not an accident that after that, at the beginnings of the so-called pivot to Asia that Obama and Hillary Clinton. Um, and I think it was partly, I mean, I mean, it was obviously broader calculations. Um but the, the, you know, you don't treat the American press like that if you don't think, you know, chi the Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party respects power, uh, and they they have many techniques to get their way, and many ways to uh, bully and intimidate, um, uh, and they don't like it when people push back and they thrash around. But if you hold your nerve and push back, often they'll back off, and so. Um, and I think that's part of the dynamic of what's going on now, actually. Um, but uh, I think, you know, you see that also in, you know, some you know, writings by Chinese intellectuals. There is this perception that the West and the U.S. is going down and China's going up and it's going to be, you know, and that feeds into the Xi Jinping, a great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation and the Chinese dream and, uh, you know, Chinese strategic thinkers talking about how you know, the first island chain in Asia, which is essentially Japan, Taiwan, Philippines, that, that you know, in the ideal world, the American influence would be pushed back from that. Um, if the U.S. were the world's sole superpower dominating everything the way it was seen to be, I don't think they would be behaving. They would be, their calculations would be different. It's basically an isolation policy. The China? Yeah. No, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's 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 it, it's not an isolate. It's it's um, I think it's very muscular externally. Throw their weight around when they you know if you don't if you don't get your way, you push till you get your way. Um, and then then you have the internal tightening, which is, to me, a reflection of the fact that that I think, um, the Communist Party was worried deeply about all the corruption that emerged and saw so it as a real as a real threat. Um and and um, also um I don't know it's a, it's weird and I'd be interested to know what other people think because to me you have on the you have like at the top you have very strong, very powerful. But I think there's a kind of fundamental fragility in China that that has to do with um uh, a weak economy. Um the consequences of COVID, uh, a demographic time bomb in which a third of the population is going to be over 60 in not too many years in a social safety system network that is not necessarily equipped. Um, uh, you And then you add to that Xi Jinping having changed all the rules about leadership, which were put in by Deng Xiaoping to ensure stable succession. And, you know, if in the history of the Chinese Communist Party, apart from the death of Deng and Jiang Zemin carrying on, and then Jiang Zemin handing to Hu Jintao. Every succession has been fraught. I mean, with Xi Jinping, it was the Bo Silai episode, and we still don't know what how deeply that went. But just go back. Uh, Jiang Zemin came in because Zhao Ziyang was purged and arrested. Zhao Ziyang came in because uh, um, Ho Yabang uh, was was purged uh, and arrested. 
Deng came in and push, uh, pushed out uh, Hua Guofeng. Hua Guofeng came in when the Gang of Four were purged. You know, Lin Biao was the designated heir and supposedly attempted a coup and died in a plane crash. Liu Xiaoqi was the designated heir and ended up, you know, die, you know, dying in prison um, amid political tumult. So smooth orderly succession is not something that we see over decades. And now you have a situation where John, uh, um, uh, Xi Jinping has arrogated so much power to himself, can stay on indefinitely. Um, he's 70 years old. You know, he looks great, but I know plenty of people who drop dead of heart attacks before they're seven. Something could happen. And there's no designated heir and the system that existed isn't there. And then you have the external factors, which are the, I think, the, the, um, China's external relations are not good. If you look around the world, they've and the Chinese behavior has led to a fraying of relations with South Korea, with Japan. Taiwan is very problematic. The Philippines, under the new president, has just agreed to allow American bases. The, the Americans are going to sell nuclear submarines to Australia. The EU is pushing back. The Netherlands is joining the United States and not selling advanced chips. Lithuania is defying China and being friendlier to Taiwan. Um, so you put all that together and while China, so I don't buy the sort of inexorable rise of China. I totally don't buy the coming collapse of China scenario either. I think that's a fantasy. But I think it's going to be bumpier than, you know, give it years. And I think, I, I think uh, internally, there are a lot of issues that, and the Communist Party has proved pretty successful in handling a lot of stuff that might have toppled other governments. But this is problematic. And I think they're going to have to find ways to, to deal with it effectively if they, if they want to continue. I'd like to take another online question. <laughs> um, so this is a, sort of a two part, but I think they're related. The first is about the ethical questions that arise when you have a journalist who is writing for one audience, but about another group. So you're, you're interviewing, you're speaking with Chinese, and you're, but you're writing for an English reading, an English reading audience, presumably mostly in the U.S. Um, what kinds of uh, issues arise from that? Particularly ethical issues arise from that. Um, and then, just briefly about the relationship between the foreign correspondents and local correspondents. Well, the second one is, uh, I think, when we were, when we were there, we always felt China. I mean, I always felt Chinese journals knew a lot more than we did, and we always tried to be friendly with them and. They knew a lot and could write very little, and we didn't know very much, but could write whatever we wanted. And so sometimes you had people who would help you, and sometimes you didn't. And uh, there are a lot of people who are good journalists in China, especially in the last, you know, up till recently, people who have this wanted to do good journalism as we know it. And there was quite a lot of good journalism, especially in sort of business and so on, um, less so now. On the first one, I don't know that it's an ethical issue. I mean, you just, you know, you want to, you know, your job is to understand and as accurately and fairly convey in terms that your audience can absorb what it is you're seeing and learning in the place that you are at. And that's true for any foreign correspondent. So it's not a question of ethics. It's a question of good journalism. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for your insights. That was fascinating. So um, would, would you be able to talk more about the restrictions that the remaining journalists now are subject to, um, like their movements or their activities, what kind of restrictions, or is there what kind of safety concerns? And then, then you, you say that most of the U.S., news media, they ha have moved their stuff out of China. But what about entries, say, um, UK correspondents it's, or, or Canadian? Or yeah. Is it the same? Is it because the, like, the tension caused by when Trump expelled the Chinese journalists? Or Well, the, the journal, I mean, journalists didn't move out. They were ordered to go. The important distinction. Um, <laughs> They're, they're, they're um, you know, the Foreign Correspondents Club of China puts its report out, and that's not just American journalists. So, I mean, my book is about American journalists. Um, 
but I think a lot of a lot of other foreign journalists would have similar experiences. Um, in terms, you know, I, I don't I don't think the 10, 10 day rule does. I mean, you can get on the plane, go to to many places now, uh, even Xinjiang, I think. Um, but you're going to be spotted. You're going to be followed. Um, you know, you're going you're, you're going to be hassled if you interact with people. Um, and you're often going to find people who are, and it raises, you know, raises ethical questions about if you buy a can of soda from the vendor and the vendor is then going to be hauled in by the police. And I mean, the New York Times did a very interesting piece, I think in 2018, they said three reporters to Xinjiang and they realized they couldn't talk to anybody. They, A, they wouldn't learn anything and B, anybody they spoke with, they would get into trouble. So they didn't, they simply observed for a week or 10 days. And then they did a piece that was based on what they observed and the photos and videos they took. And they just, they made it clear. We, we didn't talk to anybody because not doable. Um, there have been other instances where, where uh, I think in, in, in Assignment China, there's a, uh, uh, Alice Su of the LA Times talks about going, I think Henan had these very bad floods in 2021. And she went down and was talking to people and she was with a German correspondent, kind of tall, blonde haired guy, I guess. And the, uh, the Youth League of the local Communist Party had put out something on the internet, a, a denouncing a BBC reporter and sort of urging people to report him. And this crowd thought this German guy was the BBC reporter. And they had a really ugly encounter with angry crowds. And then when she tweeted about it, she got threats online and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a very intimidating, it's not a fun beat. And it should be, it's a great country. It's a fantastic country, interesting people, you know, amazing things going on. And you're just, they're just, but what you're interacting with is the harshest, most unpleasant parts of that society and the other parts that would balance it, you just don't get to. So that's reflected in what's covered, how it's covered, which is really, and I think it's bad for China. It's not just bad for consumers of news because this sense of China as kind of rich living and breathing society is, is, is not being conveyed in the way it ought to be. I think that, that's something that non-journalists may not be aware. I mean, there are so many other Americans in China, or mm. have been up until COVID, yeah. businessmen, teachers, you know, people in all walks of life. And the way they interact with society is different from the way journalists do, because as soon as you say you're a journalist, the, re the response you get is quite different than if you say, I'm a businessman, I'm investing money, right. et cetera. Um, but, you know, even like if some of you, I'm sure, know the work of Peter Hessler. Um, he's written wonderful books, and and um, he was teaching at Sichuan University, mm -hmm. and he, and um, for the last couple of years, and and some months ago, they they wouldn't renew his visa. So here's, a, I mean, here is the the classic example of the journalist who is not chasing the sensational headlines, who is as sympathetic and empathetic to ordinary Chinese people as it's possible to be. Um, Whose, whose work reflects that. And the system now can't be flexible enough to allow him to stay on in China. That, I think, tells you all you need to know about the direction it's gone. So with that, thank you, Mike, so much. This has been fascinating. Great. Well, let me just say that the, the book is available as a Kindle if you, uh, if you, have, if you like eBooks, and it's available on, on Amazon, and it should should either be in your local bookstore or you, they'll, they'll order it. So if any of this has stimulated your interest, it's, it's worth taking a look. And else you can read Kathy's memories of Tiananmen Square. Right.